Okay, we're going to start in this session with just remembering what we were talking about at the end of yesterday with uh, science and technology. Um, this is another one that I loved. I, I failed uh, biology and I, I failed, I barely got through my college requirement for a science course, but I love science. So I think I'm going to do physics for maybe a thousand years in eternity or something like that. What a meditation on God science is. One of the things I ran into when I was coloring the scriptures was where do you put miracles? Are those science? <laughs> or do you put that in church? But of course to put it in church says miracles can only happen when we gather together. And, and of course miracles happen in all, in all parts of life. And, and um, this led me to the pursuit of where did we get the idea that a miracle was God breaking his own laws? Because there is absolutely nothing in scripture that indicates that's what God is doing. And it actually comes to us out of the, as so many things do, out of the rationalist era, where, where we got this idea that if we couldn't understand it, then it wasn't, then it, then, then it was God breaking law. That we could understand all law. And so if we couldn't understand it, if we couldn't explain it, then God must be breaking his own law. Well, that, that comes out of humanism. See, it, the science fiction of my childhood is now a daily experience. So when I was a kid, um, the, the big science fiction thing on Flash Gordon was when they walked through the door, it went... And I can remember thinking, oh, this is so cool. You know, I just walk up to the door. Well, you know, we've got that downstairs. That's absolutely nothing. And so I think a more biblical definition um, and a more consistent definition with the nature and character of God is a miracle is God using the laws he has created at a higher level than we understand. And so what may, be, what may be a miracle in the New Testament may become medical practice today. We are healing more blind than Jesus did. We assume when Jesus says that, he means praying for people, and he does mean that, but he also means discovery of cures. And it's the split thinking that makes us decide which one we're going to get on the side of. God says, no, I use both. Yeah. And miracles will never be the norm, but I know more about how I made the cosmos than you do. I, you know, I'm, I love to beam me up Scotty and Star Trek and all that, and I, we know we can break down our molecular structure. We don't know how to put it back together yet, so that makes beaming us a little suspect. But, but eventually we will get it. And of course Jesus could walk through a wall because he would understand molecular structure and what held it together and understand you know, how to do that, that his, his, uh, his power is completely adequate. Well, we might be able to do that too, but maybe not here. See, it, so, so many people say, well, if you, if you can understand how God did a miracle, then it's no longer a miracle. Why is that? <laughs> what, what, where did that come from? You know, suppose we can figure out how the Red Sea parted. It parted when the Egyptians were on, on them and going to kill them. I mean, uh, you know, and we still would have a hard time reproducing that miracle, but, but what is it in us besides rationalism and a history of thought that makes us think if we can understand it, then it's less God? Well, that's split thinking. And that leads to, to, um, to mysticism and a, a biblical faith that is detached from the material world that God made. Okay, so the other place, the other place I thought, hmm, where do we put demons and angels? <laughs> hmm, what do you color that? It's, you know, clearly not government and economics and 
demons don't stick to just, you know, messing with Christians. And so it's clearly outside of the ecclesiastical institution. And I thought, well, you know, it is, it is uh, the, the paranormal. Uh, we should not be against the study of the paranormal. Uh, unfortunately, it's lost people studying the paranormal in the main. Uh, but, you know, and those who are into aliens, they're all researching demons and angels. Because God says the material order of the world is made by me. There's nothing out there that isn't made by me, and there's nothing that doesn't function by law. And so literally, Scripture tells us the authority of demons and angels and the parameters of it, and they can't act outside of it. They cannot act outside of it. They are not free agents who just do anything they want. You know, they have a certain amount of freedom, but they have borders on their freedom, just like human beings do, just like government does. And so the study of the paranormal, even though it's in a context of lost people, is really going to eventually validate. We have had visitors. <laughs> We've had many of them. They've always been coming and going. In fact, we still see them on occasion and don't know what they are. And it's completely consistent with Scripture. Does that, is that just so far out it makes you want to go home? <laughs> but is it biblical to wait for a spaceship to come and take you away? Well, not exactly a spaceship. Okay, so then the closest to science, on one side... The priesthood is the closest to science because God tied the function of the priesthood to health care. So diagnosing begins in the books of Moses. The whole concept that there are invisible things that transmit disease is already there in Moses, although it will take us almost 3,500 years or more to discover that. The concept of bodily fluids being the most, the most um, uh, virulent transmitters of disease is all there in the books of Moses. But it will take us thousand years, thousands of years to catch up and discover. But the priesthood has to deal with it even then. So they deal with infections and skin diseases and mold in the house. And they are told if a house has mold and you clean it out and you, and you wash all of that and you close it up for a period of time and then the priest comes back and he checks it. If the mold is returned, you do it one more time and leave it locked up. And then the priest comes back and he checks the house again. And if it still has mold, you tear it down and you take all the materials to a faraway place to dump them. That would be called a toxic dump. See, because they don't have disinfectants yet to figure out how to deal with the mold. But God understood that mold would permeate everything. Everything. And would kill the people in it. So you've got this wonderful link between the priesthood and the material world and science. And on the other side, you have this wonderful link between science and business. Um, in fact, my university, the University of the Nations, puts those two together. So we don't have, um, we don't have a school of business. We have science and technology, and business development is in that. Um, that was our provost, Dr. Howard Momstadt's brainchild. He was a scientist, and he said the future of business, the future of development is always in science. Mm -hmm. Business is the conduit. And I, I embrace that. I separate the two because science is so important to, to the foundations of our thought, the concept of the material world, the concept of time, um, apart from business. But I see why he puts them together. Because the laws of business build on the laws of the material world. Okay, so, so you cannot do in business anything you want to do. <laughs> because the world, the cosmos, doesn't function any way we want it to function. It functions the way God created it, and when we violate it, it will send us signals, and when we cooperate with it, it will send us signals. 
So in scripture, uh, business is taught, if you want to start in Genesis and run straight through, through primarily in the Old Testament an agrarian model because they are agrarian cult economies. So they're all agrarian economies in those days. And when I first studied it, I thought, well, this is because of where where uh, Moses is writing in history. But the farther I went in the study of business, the more I realized, no, the laws of business, the laws of agriculture are the laws of business. And so God, God is teaching it in an agrarian model, but the values that are there permeate all of business, no matter where, and I want to come back to that. So, so business and economics reveals Jehovah Jireh, God the provider. I love this. We know these names so well, but when we worship God and use them, we don't think about who he is in that. You know, we don't differentiate between the king and the father and the, and, and the high priest and Jehovah Jireh who wants to provide and has created the perfect biosphere. <laughs> to provide everything that is needed by every creature he has made if we will follow his laws. And, and so Genesis is a physicist's dream. First we have chaos. <laughs> then we have space. Then we have matter. Then we have life. So environment, life. Environment, life. And the call of business is to create the environment and the things needed to sustain life, to create a quality of life. It is taking what God has made and taking our abilities to, 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 to utilize that in a way that's sustainable and creates a quality of life globally. Okay, so, so scripture is free market, private ownership, government as uninvolved as possible, except, you know, it would be better if business would do weights and measures themselves, but if they don't self-regulate, we'll have to have a government that will, so sin is always present. Um, you know, probably it's better that government makes currency than business makes currency. And so there are things we need government involved in as far as as little regulation as possible unless there's too much greed. So the judgment on, on misusing the freedom of a free economy is you have to have regulation. <laughs> that is God's counterbalance. If we don't self-govern, if you bring it down to a personal level, when we're young, our parents will step in, <laughs> and they'll step in as long as they can. And when, they're, when we're too old for our parents to step in, if we will not self-govern, then the police will step in, or the military. <laughs> <laughs> but we will not continue in our, in our anarchy, because society one way or another, sometimes more benevolently, sometimes terribly, ruthlessly, will intervene and govern us for ourselves. Okay? Well, God has created that system of checks and balances. When, uh, when an economy, when business will not self-government, when greed becomes the norm, then God's judgment is the government will have to step in. That's not God's design. But it, it's, it's better than doing nothing. Uh, I tell you, when I talk to my American friends about this, it, they, they don't like that at all. They don't like that. But the fact is that God giving us ownership and the right to work and the right to earn and the right, the, the, the right to a free market is not unlimited. There are borders on those freedoms. That's God's design, but when the design is abused, then regulation is required. Regulation is never as good as self-governance. But it's essential to keep us from self-destructing. Okay, so, so the, man, the attribute of God 
that business is responsible for is, God, is God's goodness. Goodness, good in the Hebrew, modifies something material. So you wouldn't say you're a good girl uh, because it's a, good has to do with value and all human beings have value therefore all human beings are good if you use the word properly not meaning they act nicely but they have value okay so when 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 uh, when when the hebrews use the word they always applied it to something like this is a this is a, a good computer uh, this is a this is a good ring. If you're gonna rob me, take this one, please. <laughs> See, uh, or 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 in uh, this is a cheap ring. This is a, a cheap chair. This is a good chair. They would modify. This is good food. This is bad food. This tastes bad. This tastes good. This is healthy. This isn't healthy. When they would say good wine, it would have to do with the fact. Oop, I use that wine illustration. Please forgive me. But Jesus made good wine <laughs> at the end of the wedding, as opposed to bad wine, which was wine that didn't taste very good. Okay, so the goodness of God is revealed in material blessing. And you can't separate the two in the biblical concept of God. You can't talk about God being good with any understanding to a people who are starving to death. You're going to have to demonstrate something to show them goodness. Because, because by God's definition, goodness is attached to a quality of life. Okay, so it's business's responsibility through work and through creations of goods and services to create a quality of life and reveal the goodness of God. In God's design, business will make a profit because if you don't make a profit, you're not sustainable. But, it, but business will make a, a profit while paying a livable wage. All over the world, I have people say to me, I, sometimes the more education you have, the more you lose your mind. It's, it's a mystery to me. Or you shut off part of your mind or something. But they'll say to me, well, like it's a really sophisticated question. What is livable wage? <laughs> and I go, well, a livable wage, let's see. We start with you should only work six days a week. And we add on to that that God gives everyone sleep. So we, we can say, you know, a 12 hour day, 16 hour day, <laughs> you know, if you're going to get any rest, most of us need eight hours. So let's say a 12 hour day is the max. Um, and let's see, in that 12 hours, six days a week, you need to, uh, you need to be able to buy food. We can agree that food is uh, livable, <laughs> needed to be li to live. Water. Uh, something to protect you from the elements, uh, transportation to and from work. Um, be nice to have a bed. I suppose that's not absolutely essential, but but we can we can figure out in any economy the minimum that it takes to feed yourself, clothe yourself, get to and from work. That is a no-brainer. It's mathematics. It's not. You know, magic. And so people say to me in many parts of the world, well, then I could never afford to run my company. And then I say to them, then you're not a business. Mm. You're, you're slave labor. Sure. And God hates slave labor. Mm. <laughs> you can tell that in the book of Genesis. Economic rights is one of the five sins. This economic injustice is one of the five sins that will destroy a nation. If you, if, you, if you go to the prophets, which, you know, I don't know why today we want prophets all the time, because when the prophet needs to come, it's not good. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, if you look at the prophets and say, okay, what were the people actually doing? 
that the prophets are coming to them and saying, this is why you're going to destroy yourselves. Okay, we kind of have a general sense of doing something really awful. And it's so general, we don't recognize when our own community is doing the same thing. <laughs> okay, so I went through and I marked everything they were doing. Doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, and therefore. And lo and behold, every prophet gives us five things. The first is political injustice. Meaning you deny rights that God has given for, to the right people for the right things at the right time. Okay, the second was economic injustice, and second meaning most often repeated. The third was adultery and the destruction of the family. The fourth was the loss of the value of our words. Yea is no longer yea, or even maybe, or... And the fifth was idolatry in the believers. God is, how can I say this? God is not panicked about idolatry and the lost. If you are lost, you are idolatrous. And the solution is that you come to Christ and find reality. God's concern and what he is what he is driving home in the Old and New Testament, in the Old Testament idolatry in the believers, in the New Testament false teachings in the church, is what will destroy the work of God is, is idolatry in those who call themselves followers. And what is idolatry? Thinking that disagrees with God's truth. Putting your hope in an idea the world has created rather than the truth God has revealed. So God takes economic injustice very seriously. And how does he measure it? Well, it's interesting. He measures it the same way he does political justice. You go to the bottom of society and measure their rights. You go to the poorest of the poor and measure, are they willing to work? And if they're willing to work, are they able to work? And if they're able to work and will work, can they make enough to live on? And you'll be shocked. He does not measure by the top. He doesn't measure by the GNP. GNP, did I get that right? Those, you know, those letter problems. He, although it's fine, it's one way to measure how the whole is doing. God measures by the bottom of the rung. So, the, so the, you know, in the Western world, especially America, we go, well, biggest GMP in the world, which is, you know, fine, it's a fact. But are there more poor or less poor, more unemployed or less unemployed? That's what God looks at. Because you can create an, a wonderful GNP while destroying your economy from the bottom. And then you begin to get this great split and you have what all poor countries have. You have an elite and you have a great mass of poverty and you have nothing in the middle. Welcome to Brazil. Welcome to India, which might emerge, you know, but there, are no, there is no such thing as a poor country. There are only poor people. Every country is able to produce what is needed for its people. So where do we get poor countries from? Well, from distorted thinking and from uh, greed. But I wish greed were the biggest problem. The biggest problem is we are just clueless about what has value. So here's what God says builds an economy. Land. <laughs> no wonder you needed an empire. Oop, sorry. <laughs> land and people. If you have land and you have people, you have sustainable wealth. I know nobody believes this. Not today. 
But this is what God says. And so he takes the poorest of the poorest people that have been slaves for 300 and some years, been refugees 435 years, uh, who, have, who have no skills except doing what they're told. We call that a, a welfare mindset. <laughs> uh, they've never earned a salary. They, they don't own anything. They've never governed themselves, and they're in the middle of a desert. And, and when they did have an occupation, they were, they were shepherds and they were nomads. And, and God takes them into the wilderness and begins to, he says, you're not a nation, but I'll make you a nation. You're not a people, but I'll make you a people. And he begins to form them around the institutions and values and principles that he has created. And, and uh, they get a little delayed out there for quite a few years because not every generation is ready to change. <laughs> and so they just die, which is the hope we all have when we love change. <gasps> Sorry. Um, and, and what's the first thing he requires of them to, to own land? 72 times in Deuteronomy, God says, take the land, take the land, take the land, take the land. Why? They don't want it. Why? Because as nomads, your mindset is, okay, the grass is all gone. Now we'll go over here. Grass is all gone. Now we'll go over here. This is what American cattle ranchers loved about America before the sheep came and they started building fences. We fought wars over this because the cattlemen didn't want to think about how to steward their land to create enough for their horse, their cattle. They wanted to just roam wherever the grass was green. Okay, now there's, there's nothing wrong with that except you cannot build sustainable quality of life on a nomadic culture. Why? Because it's short range thinking. Okay, so when you lose the idea of time forward movement, past, present, future, or, or you never had it. You do not have the capacity for development because development is a multi-generational process. Okay, first, we have to have land. Second, now think about the business model. You know, we, we, then we have to think, what will the land produce? And then we have to think, what does the market need? And then we have to figure out how we're going to get the upfront money to plant because it will be, you know, seven to nine months before we have any crop. And if we don't have upfront money, we will starve before the crop comes in. And then we better have thought at the beginning about distribution because the crop may come in and we, ha we have no way to get it to the market. So now it just rots in the field. So we're poorer than we were when we started the business plan. <laughs> okay, once we get it to the market, uh, then we need to sell it at a profit because we have invested up front. <laughs> And so we need to pay that off. And so if we don't plan ahead, if you farm, you know, nobody goes into farming for a year except someone that's lost their mind. <laughs> or never knew anything about farming. So you go into farming for at least five to seven years before you begin to turn a profit. And what's the average lifespan of a new startup business? Seven years. If you make it past seven years, you probably have a sustainable model. And, and the, 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 the money, the multiplication, doesn't come in those early years because it's invest, 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 repay, repay, save, get by on as little as possible, and then, <sighs> <sighs> and so then you buy more land. <laughs> Because the money is not in what you're making off of your product, the money is in the land. Okay, now nomads don't want to think that far in advance. And the Jews don't want to think that far in advance. And here's a headline. Everywhere in the world that there is increasing in systemic poverty, meaning it's out of control, they have a circular view of time. And that has also come back to the Western world. The Western world that really understood Moses' contribution in Genesis, number, uh, Genesis uh, 1 and 2. 
when he said day one, day two, plan ahead, number your days, consider your times, understand the seasons. Yeah. Europe, which became forward thinkers so that, so that the South African, uh, Dutch and French came back to Europe to get grapes because the grapes they had were German. They were, <laughs> weren't so good. Sorry. And so, and then they made the trip back to South Africa and, and the French grapes did better in our soil, but they had no oak for barrels. They had no trees appropriate. So they came back to Europe and they got seedlings and they planted oaks and it would take 300 years for those oak trees to produce wood large enough to create a wine barrel out of. <laughs> <laughs> Europe doesn't have this mindset anymore. We'd go, import the wine. American, I don't know that America ever had that mindset, but our founders did, but they came from Europe. <laughs> See, the postmoderns don't go after life, they wait for it to come to them. It's on a wheel. Circular time destroys self-initiative and builds in the concept of fatalism and there's nothing I can change. This dominates three quarters of the world's cultures and it's now taking it over and eating up the cultures that did have the revelation where it did produce its fruit. To farm, you have to think ahead. Mm -hmm. And by the way, some of what helped the Europeans was weather. <laughs> Okay, so don't think it was all our brilliant understanding of God and his ways. Some of it was winter. And, and if you don't plan ahead, you will be dead. And of course, the material world has laws. You cannot plant your crop in the winter. Period. You say, well, I'm going to pray. <laughs> No, it won't work. Now, I don't hear Christians today applying it to farming, but I, I have worked with, with business people for, for 40 years. <laughs> and I just shake my head when the Christian guy comes in. <laughs> and you say, well, give me a quote. And he says, well, I don't, I, I'm, new, I'm a new startup company. I can't do that. Well, tell me the, the, process, the services you're going to provide. Well, I, I don't know yet. Tell me what you need and I'll provide that. But I am a Christian. I'm, we're, we'll work together. I'm a good guy. I think, well, you may be a Christian. I don't doubt that, but you have no business sense at all. I, I would rather have a Muslim <laughs> who understands the principles of God even though he doesn't know God. Then one of these, uh, one of these, and they're a type. I'm not saying all Christians are like this, but but they are abundant, who think that all they have to do is get a, you know something in prayer, and have no startup capital and have no uh, plan, <laughs> and God's going to bless it. And I have seen, since business as missions has become so popular in the last 20 years, I have seen business people who, before they got into this, had perfectly good godly business thinking. And then when they began to get the idea, no, I'm going to do business as missions, they lost their minds. <laughs> I think, no, you, but it's that split thinking. If I'm going to do it God's way, it will be nonsense. Well, they don't say nonsense. Okay, so let just quickly, before we close out, I want to look at Deuteronomy 23. Because I've been speaking on this for well over 20 years now. And, um, and I have been saying to people, America fails on all counts. We're headed for trouble. And for a long time, everybody thought I'd kind of, you know, lost the plot, that I was just one of those doomsday people. But now everybody thinks I was, you know, either a prophet or clairvoyant. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll skip the part about... Forbidden unions and all that. Let's see. We'll go to... I think it's 23. 
I wanted to read it. Okay, I can't find it, so that's so typical. I'll just tell you what it says. One of the things God says to Israel is, in the land I am taking you to, you're to have no debt, meaning national debt. You can lend to countries, but you may not borrow from them. Oops. <laughs> now, he is saying to this to the poorest people on the face of the earth that have been slaves and refugees for 435 years. They haven't even gone into the promised land. But he is saying to them, your land and your work will produce what you need. Now, what happens if you can't borrow? You, you must develop the resources you have. You must live within your means. And so what happens as you develop? You are developing from the ground up. Okay, another thing God says in Deuteronomy is um, there, shall, there shall be no poor among you. The national policy of Israel was to be uh, the elimination of poverty. Now, people always go to me, well, Jesus said, you'll always have the poor among you. Yes, because people won't want to work. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Choosing poverty is one of the rights God gave us. But we are not to have an economic system that creates poverty regardless of what your choices are. That's the point. In South Africa, they say to me, ah, oh, so many of these people don't want help. I said, then don't help them. Help the ones who do want help. God always works with our choices. Start here. And we get this idea, we kind of, as soon as we go to social development and economic development, we kind of go socialist on God. And we start thinking about giveaway programs and, you know, and that we have to help people that don't want to be helped. Blah, blah, blah. That is not what God is talking about. He is talking about taking that little entrepreneur that runs out and cleans your windshield, whether you want him to or not, who's trying to earn his living rather than just stand there and beg. Start with that guy. Say, you know, how much do you make there? I can help you design a business where you can make enough to live on. <laughs>